Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to episode number three of the White Knuckle Podcast. Hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Well, I can't believe it's here. It's time to light this candle. Today is our first official episode of the White Knuckle Podcast. Todd and I have been working on this for a long time, and we couldn't be more excited to bring it to you. We believe we've got all the bugs worked out after a couple episodes, so we're ready to launch this thing. We're ready to get going. Um, Don't be afraid to comment on our Facebook page and leave comments about how you felt about the show, what you thought we could have done better, what you thought we could bring to you, uh, anything that you think could be beneficial to our show to help to bring to you the kind of content that you're looking for. Without you, there's really no reason for a podcast. So we sincerely appreciate you taking the time to listen. We sincerely appreciate any feedback that we get from you. We sincerely hope that with every episode that you gain one little nugget of information that will help you become a better hunter, a better shed hunter, and more important than all that, just be able to have more fun while you're doing this sport that we all love called bow hunting. Okay, now that we've got all the rah-rah BS out of the way, let's get down to the brass tacks. I want to give you a little bit of a sneak peek into what we're going to be looking at down the road. And what we're going to be looking at down the road in terms of guests are guests uh, that come from all different uh, parts of this industry. Um, We're going to have other people that have their own shows. We're going to have people that are professional shooters. We're going to have industry reps. We're going to have our sponsors on talking about their products and how you can more effectively use their products. Uh, we're going to, we're going to do everything and we're even going to do some crazy stuff, stuff that you're not going to expect. So don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, just about anywhere that's capable of hosting a podcast is going to be hosting our podcast. So get on there, subscribe to the link and you'll get a notification every time a new show comes up. At this point, we plan on having a show every other week. And if circumstances dictate otherwise, we'll have more. The bottom line is you just need to subscribe and you'll get a notification every time we do a new show. And believe me, you're not going to want to miss one. Before we kick this thing off, we've got to do a little bit of business and thank our sponsors. We sincerely want to thank Lone Wolf Portable Tree Stands, Ozonix, Covert Trail Cameras, Takamati Seeds, Stick and Pick, Vapor Trail Archery, Wicked Tree Gear, Mrs. Dopey, Fourth Arrow Camera Arms, Elite Archery, and last but not least, Vortex Optics. Well, I guess it's that time to put our money where our mouth is. Well, as I said earlier, it's time to light this candle, so strap yourself in for a white knuckle ride. Here we go with the first ever White Knuckle Podcast. Well, as I said before, it's time to kick this thing off. But before we start, I just want to take one more opportunity to thank you all for your support thus far. With that said, let's get Todd Pringnitz on the line. Todd, how's it going today? Great, man. How are you doing, Jason? Really good. Uh, other than the inch and a half of ice outside it's uh it's it's all right i don't mind 40 degrees in january so i can't i'm complain. just starting to feel like a, i'm just starting to feel like a human being again after the ata show yeah you know uh david and i did a show uh you know earlier this week or last week late last week and uh at the end of that show i realized that we talked about a lot of nothing um and not that it was content list but there's so much to see at that show that you can't really concentrate on one or two or three specific things like you know i was in meetings while you were at your booth working your booth i was in meetings the whole time and or different times so i I, that was where my head was at and you know everybody's like what kind of cool gear did you see and and uh (laughs) Uh, yeah, right. I, I know my wife decided that she wants Seth McGinn's uh, can cooker. Um, that's my takeaway. 
<laughs> I, dude, I, I, we have guys, contractors here, and so we got back from the show, and they're working here the next day, and I, they said, you know, how, how was the show? How was the show? And I said, oh, it's great, you know, and I probably didn't have as much enthusiasm as they expected. And I said, well, basically from 7 in the morning till 2 a.m., you're talk- I'm talking nonstop. It's for three straight days, all you do is talk, 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 listen, listen, listen. But between being, you know, uh, the ATA show for hunting, obviously it's a big, a big deal for any bow hunter. Uh, but with the business and all the years of business and everything that goes on, by the time I even get to the ATA show, I'm exhausted because we have to get all the new products ready, yada, yada. But we could go on and on and on about how cool the ATA show is. But today we're ca- talking about a little bit of you and a little bit of me, and then we're going to get into some shed hunting later in the episode. Perfect. Yeah, let's let's do that. You know, for those of you who don't know Todd, and I can't imagine that there's too many of you, but you know, Todd, we've known each other for boy a long time now, and we'll get into that later. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got down this crazy road called the outdoor industry. Well, I'm just going to dive right in, but essentially I was born and raised in West Michigan, uh, a beautiful little beach town called Grand Haven, and um, I was always enamored by the outdoors, and I was actually more of a fisherman when I was younger because I grew up on a road near uh, the Grand River and um, spent every single day as a child um, out fishing. Man, I loved fishing for anything, and Along with that, I was also a gearhead. I remember literally some of my first memories are playing with my fishing reels, watching Hank Parker outdoors or fishing with Orlando Wilson and playing around my reel and putting new fishing line on it. And like the gear side, I was always completely enamored by. But my next door neighbor, a guy named John Fisher, I grew up right next door to him and he was a bow hunter. And my father was really never much of a deer hunter. He went out a couple times a year with his, with his buddies, gun hunting and I honestly remember in a, my whole childhood, my dad shot one buck and it was a spike. And when he did, it was like a, a family celebration. Like, Oh my Lord, dad shot a deer. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a big deal. So I never, but the, the unique like uh, circumstances and, and the, the stars aligning, but I met John, he was a nice enough guy to bring me deer hunting because my dad didn't bow hunt. And so he helped kind of get my bow and all that stuff. So when I was 12, I went bow hunting for the first time. And man, I saw a doe and two fawns. And I still remember the exact encounter and everything. And that first adrenaline rush was the first time I ever felt it. And since then, I've I've basically been hooked on bow hunting. And as I progressed uh, in archery, around the time when I turned 15 or 16 is when I really started to um, become successful. And because I had my driver's license, I could drive around. Literally from the time I was 15 years old till now, I have had to scout, set my own stands, find my own properties, uh, going back all those years. Uh, and to this day, I've still never killed a deer out of a stand that I haven't hung. But hunting in Michigan was important for my background because uh, there's a lot of people I know in this outdoor industry who are kind of born into it, born into a family that has a bunch of land or, or serious hunters and I wasn't fortunate enough to do that, but it's part of my history and part of what makes me me. I grew up hunting public land in Michigan, which is about as bad as you can get. And um, I spent 16 years doing that. Um, Somewhere along the line, I met uh, a good friend of mine named Walter Easling, and he was one of the more serious hunters in my neighborhood. And um, basically, long story short, I could not get enough and was just a whitetail hunting machine. the second part of my life is related to gear and, and how I actually got my businesses and, and whatnot going. But I, um, my dad was an engineer, uh, not a licensed engineer, degreed engineer. He, he was a blue collar guy. I worked his way up. And um, long story short, I started taking CAD classes at a local tech center when I was in high school. Um, fell right into it. I was always an artist, always really, really good at the creative stuff. And eventually uh, went through school as uh, in product design engineering. And the cool part about everything that all my background and, and everything is I remember in, I was in my bachelor's degree for, uh, engineering. And my professor told me at one point, he said, Todd, your priorities are screwed up. You spend more time traveling for hunting than you do studying 
for, for your tests. And he said, you know, your prioritors are screwed up. You're never going to make a living killing animals or hunting. He said something along those lines. And I've never forgotten it because it's been kind of the fire under my butt for all these years. And I'm like, all right, well, that, I'm not going to have your life, pal. I'm going to do things my way. So I've kind of just taken my own path. And um, many, many, many years ago, through the right um, background and work, and, and I worked for manufacturing companies. I worked for some design companies. And I was doing all of this at night, or I was working full time, going to school at night, and so then eventually starting my own company on the side uh, when I met the original owner of Lone Wolf Tree Stands, uh, Andre DeQuisto. And so for several years, I worked with him designing, developing products, and even sourcing products, um, supplying products to these companies. So I worked with Lone Wolf for a while. Um, I've worked with Muddy Outdoors, Hunt More Chairs, uh, Blind Ambitions, Bail Blinds, um, and a number of other companies outside of the hunting industry, uh, basically helping these, helping inventors and entrepreneurs create ideas, get them to market, and even supplying them the, the product. That was my background. That's my real skill is product design and manufacturing and that kind of stuff. But all the while, I started White Knuckle Productions 10 years ago, decided to move from Michigan to Iowa because I knew I needed to be where the deer lived, and I didn't want to be a traveling hunter. I'd seen enough of it seen what it did to families and um, I knew I needed to live where the deer lived and through a, tr a chance encounter and meeting of Lee Likoski many many years ago um, I ended up in southeast Iowa and there's all kinds of different stories associated with that but what I've been doing for the last 10 years is focusing on my skill of, of, of killing big mature deer building a brand started white knuckle productions Wicked Tree Gear, which we eventually sold to Tecumani Wildlife Systems last year, and I'm still very involved with the company as the president. Um, but I've got kind of a a really just dumb luck, hard work ethic of meeting the right people along the way to combine my skills and my passions into one, which is to basically be able to design and develop these hunting products for my own uh, my own needs. And along the way, we found out I'm, I'm hitting a lot of things or solving a lot of problems that a lot of other hunters have dealt with. And that's where I basically am today. I'm still trying to solve the problems that we see and deal with every day in the field. And it takes that technical skill from the uh, education side. And it also takes the in the field experience of being out there sweating, bleeding year round for these whitetails. And and I think that's where I'm just plain lucky, and I'm I'm lucky to be able to do what I do. You're you're right. You are lucky to be able to do what you do, and uh, it's it's cool that you've uh, been able to take your passion and turn it into a career. And I think there's a lot of us that would that would love to do that. And make no mistake about it, it's still, without a doubt, a lot of hard work. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of rough times. Um, but the rough times I'm assuming make the good times worth it. Am I correct? Oh, oh, for sure. And I mean, uh, you all out there in the audience, believe me, man, 20 years ago, I was looking at Andre and, and some of the other guys I met in the industry and thinking, holy cow, boy, they've got the bull by the horns. You know, they figured it out. 20 years later, looking from the, <laughs> the opposite side, there's a lot of drama financial business stress that is unavoidable and comes with the territory. And I've always kind of recognized that, Hey, if you're, you want to be self-employed, you're going to have to deal with stuff that not, well, not everybody uh, knows. So Jason's been along with me for the ride. Oh gosh. Now for seven or eight years, I think with white knuckle. And, you know, we have team members that have come and gone. We've had sponsors that have come and gone. Um, and you got to get to the point where you pretty much expect the unexpected. I mean, there's no such thing as a paycheck, an easy paycheck. I mean, I can tell you right now, Mark and Drury, Mark and Terry Drury, Wilkowski, all these guys, they do the same stuff. They're at just different levels. Um, so I think, you know, for anybody who's trying to achieve their goals, it's easy to look at some of these huge people and it just seems overwhelming. Like how, you know, how can I do that? And Jason, my favorite saying in the whole wide world is it's, another teaspoon in a 50 gallon drum. And my wife, I've been preaching this for a million years is that every single day with everything you do, 
every every phone call, every function, every every time you try to do something, it's like taking a a teaspoon full of water and putting it in a 50 gallon drum. Each teaspoon, you do not see the difference and you don't see what impact it's going to make in the long run, but you got to keep on spooning that water into that 50 gallon drum every single day. And before you know it, all of a sudden you start to see a level and that level will increase over time. And now 20 years later, you know, that's what, that's, what's gotten me here is just through pure determination and an inability to quit until I was finished with something. And that's just kind of built into my personality. I'm an anal dude, but uh, I want to hear more about you, Jason, and how the heck we ever got hooked up. Well, you know, David and I just talked about that the other day. Uh, it was, by gosh, I, I would say somewhere in the area of 2007 or 8. I'm going to go with 8. I believe it was the spring of 2008. I had contacted you because I had seen um, or first ordered and then watched Beyond the Kill and was impressed. Uh, you know, I saw the video and I said, these guys are just regular dudes. And lo and behold, um, you had been on a hunt, if I remember correctly, in Illinois and Andy and Ed Nevar, or one or the other, maybe both, both yep. were at the same area or in and around the same area that you were hunting turns out they were from the same town that i lived in uh so there was a small connection there i had no idea i had sold ed a truck way back in the day uh <laughs> and so that's that's how that's how you and i met um i came down to the deer and turkey expo i gave you a demo reel i think you called it back then uh you never called me back I emailed you, you didn't email me back because you're a busy guy, and I emailed you again and finally uh, got to talk to you, and you just said, hey, your video's really shaky, it wouldn't be something I'm interested in using, if you want to get involved, come to our film school. So uh, David and I had met you at the Deer and Turkey Expo, I called David, I said, hey, I heard back from Todd. David had had no involvement with me in the demo reel, so he can't take responsibility for the poor quality there. Um, <laughs> only only I can, and, and a friend of mine uh, by the name of Dan Kutzma. Um, you know, so I said, David, what do you think? They're having this film school down in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. You want to go? Or are you in? And absolutely, I'm in. So I, at that point, had a, I want to say it was a Canon GL2 um, as a camera. And, uh, I went down to your show. I met Aaron DeHaan. He gave me, or I bought from him one of his, his tree arms that are probably no longer in existence. And David and I went home and, you know, quite frankly, we hunted and worked our ass off. Uh, we, we started the season when it opened uh, I'll never forget it. I was in the same stand that we killed many deer on many videos out of. And, you know, we had, we opened the season that, that opening day with a buck walking under us. And that was the official start to our career with White Knuckle Productions. Um, and we really have never looked back. We ended up each killing a good deer that year. David shot one of the best bucks of his life uh, on November the 18th. Uh, the Thursday before the Saturday opener of the Wisconsin rifle season. So we worked our butts off for uh, for the deer that we got that year. And, you know, really have never looked back since. So we don't kill the biggest deer that are out there, uh, but we kill uh, some of the bigger deer that are in our area. I'll say that. Uh, with respect to me, you know, personally, I I'm married. I've got uh, a total of five kids uh, step stepchildren included live in live in portage wisconsin and have been in the car business um yes uh, the the used car salesman um you've been in the car sale uh, car sales business for 26 years this year so um i do that full time and and um now have gotten involved with you on a, a business level and and uh you know, like we talked about earlier in getting to the ATA, it, uh, it, 
it opens your eyes to a whole nother side of, of the hunting world. Um, it's, Absolutely. A, it's a competitive business. It's a competitive well, and business. It, but the other thing I will say too, from, from my standpoint, what uh, Jason, Jason Science and Dave Proc now have been, like Jason said, involved from literally the beginning. And one thing I've always loved about Jason and Dave is that no matter how bad it gets, they never quit. And they have been some of the best producers for our team all these years. Um, and I'll just say it, man, you're a killer. Dave's a killer. And there are a lot of other guys out there that are good friends or have been good friends that, um, for, and everybody knows this. I mean, whether you consider yourself a killer or you're just in, uh, getting into it, some guys just get it done. Others always seem to have an excuse, but Dave and Jason are killers and our experience and also uh, two of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And that, that's why Jason is now the GM of uh, white knuckle productions is because he's been not only a good friend, but he's smart. He's a killer. And, um, always is looking to better himself. And, um, and, and those are all great qualities that you, you find. And, you know, I'll, I'll say it, a lot of the most successful white tail hunters in the country are successful all the way around. Uh, usually you don't find a guy with a bunch of bucks on his wall. Who's lazy. I mean, it, those two things just don't go together. Um, and I've had, the, I've heard that many, many times over the years. And I mean, it's no joke that, you know, the jury brothers are, you know, really good business people. I don't have any idea where they came from or anything like that, but, you know, these guys do not get to this level because of, you know, just because they're born into money or have the property or whatever. Some of them might have some advantages that you and I don't have, but in general, most of these guys are killers in life. They're killers in business and they're killers in the field. And you just kind of got to, you got to get to that point in your hunting career where you start to feel like a predator, man. And it's like a primal thing. And I think that's what I love about hunting so much is that um, kind of makes you feel like you, you know, you're a caveman again with a spear going after a mammoth. I mean, in, especially in today's day and world and with family and business and money and all this other crap you have to deal with every day. Um, there's something about just going out pounding the ground and being a predator again. And I think that's what I love about it so much. It's so simple. Uh, but, that, but then as you get into hunting big deer, it gets so complicated and I, just all of it, the whole, the whole darn thing, man, I can't get enough of, I freaking love it. Yeah, me, me too. And, and, you know, as, as we talked, I'm, I'm thinking about a conversation that I have with my son and stepson often, and that is one simple phrase that just keeps ringing in my ear all the time. Um, actually there's many, but it's, it's something I've shared with my salespeople over the years in management. And that's, you got to do the work. You've got to do the work in it, whether it's professionally and in, in business um, or, or it's chasing a big buck. It, none of it's easy. Anything that's worth doing is going to be a real pain in your rear end. Am I, am I right, Todd? Oh, amen. And, and not only that, Jason, you have to be willing to do things nobody else is willing to do. I am. Um, and I'm just going to use this as an example. It, it really, it sets the stage We're we're, we are at the ATA show. We're, we're tearing down and I've always gotten a kick out of watching different um, companies at these different shows. And some of them have money. So they hire companies to come in and set these booths up, tear them down and all that stuff. We've never been that lucky. I mean, going to these shows, you got to drive to the show. We have to get all the product ready. I could go on and on about trade shows alone, but I'm going to give you an example of this. Scott Elrod is one of the owners of Ozonics. Ozonics is a huge company everybody knows about now, and we've been very good friends, and I've been using and helping them develop their products for years now, and they are unbelievable, like game-changing stuff. Scott Elrod, who is the owner and president, I believe he's the president uh, of Ozonics, uh, very successful in the dentist world down in Texas. He's blue-collar, down-to-earth, extremely smart. And we were tearing down for the booth, and Scott's down on the ground, hand and knees, as, as we were walking out, actually. He's on his hands and knees next to his sales guys and next to anybody else who's at the booth helping, rolling up carpet, you know, that everybody had been walking on at the show for the last three days. It's not a fun job, but there's the owner of the company, down on his hands and knees, and he didn't have to be. 
but it just shows you the type of person that that is and what it took to build a company like Ozonics. You've got to be willing to do anything. And I'll tell you, the stuff you see on TV that's edited, there's somebody doing all that work. And that's why, you know, I guess I, I'd like to kind of put a, a cement or what makes Todd Pring that's different than, you know, any other professional hunter out there. There's a few things I'm very, very, very proud of. Number one, I only bow hunt and it's not because I don't like guns. My wife gun hunts and I'm fine with that. I've just, there's always been something about the bow and arrow and it's just the challenge. I've only bow hunted. I've never hunted out of a tree stand. Like I said, that I didn't set myself, that I didn't scout myself. And more importantly, that I didn't get access to the property myself. I'm always the guy who knocked on the door. You can ask any of my friends. I'm the guy who gets out of the truck and goes and knocks on the door because I just refuse to fail. And that's a huge part of it. I've always been willing to do the things not everybody's been willing to do. But from the hunting standpoint, I have enjoyed passing more big deer than I've ever killed because to me, it's not about antler inches. I've never scored any of my whitetails. I've never actually scored a shed. I've never actually scored a piece of antler in my whole life. And I, I love it. Reason being for me, especially with filming, going after these big mature deer in my neighborhood means that they have to survive a gauntlet every year from all these other hunters. And there's a ton of hunting pressure in my area. For me, my goal now is to kill six, seven year old deer. And I really, yes, I'm trying to kill the ones with the biggest racks on their head and all that stuff. But to me, the age and these body sizes that we get on some of these big deer, man, it's like there is no other feeling on earth than being able to put yourself in a position that no other human being has ever been able to do with one of these big, mature, majestic animals that are the size of a cow. That is greater than any score. For, for so many years, that's one thing I've enjoyed hunting so much more because I've never looked at it as a competition. It's only been really a competition with myself and a competition against the animals. Um, and I mean, we all like to share trophy photos and all that stuff, but you know, I'm just not, people are calling me crazy, but I'm not motivated by answer, inch, antler inches at all. I could give a, a care less. I'd rather shoot a big, heavy buck, big monster rack, just heavy, heavy mass than a spindly thing that would score twice as big. I just don't care. There's no association with it. So I think I'm kind of an odd duck in this industry from that standpoint, because Jason, how many times have you been asked what it score? You're, you're never going to get paid for what you shoot. I mean, so it's an ego thing. Yeah, right. A, a bunch of the few and very few bucks that I've killed. Uh, I've never had them officially scored because I really don't care um cuz it 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 just doesn't matter i the bottom line is for me i set out each of those years or every year for that matter to win and you know you 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 touched on it and it it brought back memories of an old sales trainer that i had by the name of paul cummings um he said you've got to want the w you you got to want to win or you're not going to win and, um, you know, the bottom line is if you can ever live with losing, that's all you're going to have. And I think that really pertains to the deer woods. Um, you, you've got to want to go where, where no one else, um, goes and do what no one else does, especially in your respective areas. And that's not to say that, you know, what you or I do is completely different than anyone else in the world. I'm sure we all do a lot of the same things, but the bottom line is you can't sit on your but and expect good results you you, you can't uh, you just can't the other point i want to make is by by no by no means whatsoever am i judging anybody who is in the scores or in the antlers um all of my friends i mean dude some of them carry tape measures in the woods when they shoot something they can measure right on the spot i i i have absolutely as long as you're doing it legally, dude, everybody likes their own thing. So for me personally, I'm just not into the scoring thing. I, it's just not my thing. But if you are, dude, I love it, man. I, anybody and everybody who's out there chasing these deer, that's what makes hunting so killer is that it is so personal. You can do what you want. You can shoot what you want. 
and I try never to judge anybody based on what they shoot um, because dude, you know, I was once that guy. I, I shot <laughs> a bunch of young ones. I, I wounded a bunch of young ones back in my days in Michigan. Um, and I mean, dude, I've been there and everybody's got their, everybody's got their career and their story about their, their way of hunting. So by no means, um, do I mean to sound elitist or anything like that? Cause that's not me at all. But the one thing I will say is I am extremely opinionated and sometimes I can rub people the wrong way. They take that as arrogance or an ego, but it really isn't. I'm just, <laughs> anal I'm very analytical and I mean, dude, Jason, you know, if I shoot a broadhead, there's a reason I shoot that broadhead. I'm going to tell you, tell you why and why I think it's better than yours. But that also has kind of been what has built our niche in this industry because we are truthful and honest before we promote products. By the way, everybody that's promote. listening, that's Todd's way of asking for your forgiveness in case he's offended anyone um, because of his sheer passion for what he believes in. Just a side note. Absolutely. Uh, but my, I mean, for example, my wife just started hunting a few years ago. She hunts with a shotgun. I actually enjoy it because it's in a different season. I film for her and get more jacked up filming than I do actually hunting anymore. And she kills, a, uh, she killed a super slammer, huge buck this year. And we're very honest about it. We don't pretend that she is out there scouting and, oh, I chose this blind because dude, she's very inexperienced and we're fine with that. But we're honest and you know, I think the one thing in this industry, it's the only thing that I, I honestly have never felt a part, a part of the industry for a few different reasons, but one of which, because for deer, I've always put first. And I feel like for no other reason than just guys have to pay their bills. You know, a lot of times decisions are made in this industry based on the old holy dollar and that's life. But we're in a unique situation because and I've, and I've always kind of felt this way, been very lucky that I could make a living doing uh, a, a real job, design, engineering, manufacturing, um, and keep my passion for deer, a, a passion first and a business second. Um, not saying it's not a business. We can't, we got to make money just like anybody else. But I mean, you see going to the ETA show, Jason, you, you see all the shows, you see all the people there walking around and um, there's a lot People all trying to do this, is there not? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there, it's mind blowing. There's there's and I and I said it on the previous show that aired before this one. Uh you know, I got the feeling sitting in whether it was the Ozonix booth or Covert or you know, whatever booth I was sitting in with our sponsors, um, there was always someone over my shoulder waiting to take what it is that I wanted. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a competitive world and we could, we could really go on and on about that, but I think we've, we've probably covered, um, who we are and, uh, you know, maybe our credentials and maybe not, I'm not going to pretend to be a big buck serial killer. Um, I, I can tell you this, uh, when I'm after one, I'll be up early. I'll be working hard to get it. And I don't, um, take that lightly. I work my butt off for the deer that I've, I've gotten. They just, they're hard to come by. You, you know that from hunting in Michigan. Um, and this coming year I, uh, I'll draw an Iowa tag, so that'll change things a little bit. So I'm excited about that. But, uh, let's talk just a little bit about our vision for the white knuckle podcast going forward. And, uh, really what, what brought this all on is a couple of the Facebook live shows that we did and people's, you know, hunger for information about hunting or gear or, you know, whatever it was, technique, you know, and on and on and on. Um, so what we decided to do uh, after I talked with Todd for a considerable amount of time, we both collaborated and decided, let's do a podcast. It allows us the time to to 
to talk about whatever specific subject it is that we want to talk about. So we hope in the coming months that we can bring you topics that you're interested in. And by all means, don't be afraid to comment. Uh, we'd love the feedback. And don't be afraid to um, share our story with your friends. Uh, that would be the greatest compliment you could give us is, is giving our story to your friends. Uh, so as we go farther into the end of the year here, we've got a ton of guests lined up. Um, I don't want to, you know, give away all of them, but um, one of the first shows that we're going to have is about shed hunting. And any of you that have watched White Knuckle over the years know that Todd cries every time he picks up a shed. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm kidding. Certain ones. It, right. Not every, well, I mean, like a freaking uh, a two-year-old, maybe I'll get a little emotional, Jason, but I don't think tears are coming out over that one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, just... Just what Jason, just to, to quickly just go back on, when we've been producing these DVDs and web shows for the last 10 years now, and it's always been very frustrating to me because, you know, in one of my stories, like Barry Sanders or whatever, I mean, any of these different bucks that we've hunted down and killed, you there's never enough time. You can never get into the details. And I'm like very like anal, like I could tell you 15 stories about, I still remember the doe that busted us or didn't bust us or the, the details that went into that hunt that you just, you don't have enough time to edit for. And when we go to these trade shows and, and talking to these guys, like I, I can just go on and on about scent in the mornings and different times of year. I mean, there's just so much to cover. So in a, in these podcasts, being very passionate about right out of the gate, when Jason and I started doing, it, I'm like, man, this is exactly what I need for my own personal fulfillment. I feel like God's given me the right experience and I've met the right people along the way, have had the right, uh, you know, chemistry set, man, that I've been able to learn so much over the years. And just for the last 10 years, I've basically been hunting full time down in Iowa also while running, you know, two companies or whatever on the side, but it's, it's just rare to come up with, the experiences, I guess, that I've been able to be so fortunate to have. And I want to start, start sharing them. Um, there's just, there's a lot of bad information out there that's driven by product sales. And that's not our show guys and girls. We are going to be doing a show that's no BS straight to the truth. And my goal is to help you kill bigger deer and have more fun doing it. Um, because we're very honest about our failures and our successes. And you cannot achieve success without failing miserably the entire time to get to that success. And a lot of times the reason you are successful most of the time is because of the steps of failure that you've built in order to get to the top. And nowadays, anytime I'm out hunting, I've, because of experience, I've been able to realize that I don't question myself as much as I used to just because some days deer don't move. I don't beat myself up. Hey, I didn't see anything today, but all these different things we're going to share. And, and, you know, I live in Southeast Iowa, so it's a much different situation than, you know, a lot of you guys who live in Michigan, Wisconsin or whatever. And that's what I love about Jason. What he brings to the table is a perspective of uh, more of a normal, what normal people can expect. And, um, and a, a, just a different perspective from a different place. And I think that's important um, because not everybody gets the luxury of hunting, you know, sweet farmland or whatever down in the Midwest. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, so let's, let's give our listeners a little bit of a sneak peek into our first episode, which is going to be about shed hunting. Um, just give us the, the, the top five things without going too far into it that you're, that you're going to talk about in terms of, Todd Prignitz's tips on finding the bone in the woods. I get asked this so many times by private messages, by emails and everything is, you know, I've been shed hunting a bunch and I, I, I've never found an antler. I, I don't find them. What am I doing wrong? You know, people automatically assume they're doing something wrong. Well, I actually laid in bed last night awake thinking about this topic and how to break it down. And I'm, I'm a process guy. So I've broken it down into a few different things. I have four different topics that I've listed. Number one is where are the deer? Um, it's very easy 
to go walk. Okay. Everybody's capable. We have two legs guys who have lost legs overseas or whatever. They might have a little bit uh, of greater challenge, but for the most part, everybody can walk. Right. So it's easy to do. Sometimes we use our legs instead of our brains. And I have been out on so many miserable shed hunts over the years on pieces of property that didn't have a gall darn deer on them. But the hard worker blue collar side of me says, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. Um, and brother, I have wasted hundreds, maybe thousands of miles, but hundreds of miles on the wrong properties. I now today know where almost all the deer are in my neighborhood, but going back 10 years, I'm just like a lot of you guys every year. I was going out, finding new farms, trying to kill the next buck in it for year after year after year. I was hunting new properties, constantly looking for the next one. My number one tip for everybody is if you have a piece of property to shed hunt, before you go out there and spend all day, go out there and make sure there's deer on it. If you're not seeing fresh deer sign and tracks, droppings, rubs, scrapes, even during shed season, you should be seeing some of this fresh activity, not obviously rubs, but I mean, they scrape your own. You should, it should be obvious. Number two, have the deer shed. Okay. It's another thing you can, <laughs> we've been out shed hunting and oh, there goes a bow. Oh yeah. He's carrying both sides. Well, it's pretty hard to find a shed when they haven't shed yet. Um, we do this with trail cameras. If it's illegal in your area, you can put out corn, put your camera over it. And usually within about a week, you're going to know what deer in the area that have or have not shed. And that's pretty much what everybody does that I know to monitor whether the bucks have shed or not. Um, number three, is any, anyone else walking on that property? So are you hunting public land? That means there's going to be other guys out there. Are you hunting private land that you have exclusive access to? Are you hunting private land that trespassers are going to go on? All of these things factor into my frequency of shed hunting. How often will I shed hunt that property? And for an example, if it's public land, I'm going to be out there every week for two months. If it's my own property that I can control, manage, keep cameras around and make sure nobody's in there, I'll wait until I know 90% of the deer have shed before I go shed hunting. So again, it just depends on where you're at. Finally, number four. How do I actually walk or shed hunt a property and the different patterns? And that's my specialty. And we're going to get into this in our shed hunting episode big time is there is a strategy on how to walk properties uh, and every property is different. And I have become a master of mentally mapping out my shed season. And I literally, Jason, I, I can, I can remember if I start walking next week, come March 3rd, March 15th, when I go walking through a section of property, I'll remember exactly where I've walked that year. And I, I will never, ever, ever walk the same trail twice or the same area twice unless I have a reason to be doing that. And we're going to get into the depth of my mental craziness about shed hunting and how I lay in bed at night, mapping courses, how I'm going to do it for different days, different times of the year, I'm a nut over this man and I, I, I can't get enough and I'm going to try to tell and teach everyone something, whether you're a shed hunting master or you've never found a shed ever before in your whole life, you're going to get something out of our shows. And if nothing else, it's going to be entertaining as heck because you'll see inside of the brain of someone who is legitimately probably crazy. My last tip is you better keep listening to our podcast because I'm telling you, we're going to have some killer information coming out this year. I've gotten to the point now where I'm starting, I'm, I'm ready to start sharing some of my real, real deep tactics, stuff I've never talked about before. And um, I want you to utilize me, manipulate me, use everything out of my facet of information and experiences and failures, tons of failures to make yourself a better hunter. And I guarantee you one thing, you listen to it on, the WKP podcast, it's the truth. It is not driven by anything other than passion, and we love you. For every, every customer, every person listening, I'll do anything I can to make you a better hunter. Awesome. Well, I look forward to doing that show because I certainly could use some help in that area. And I think 
you know, in doing that show, I'll be able to find out whether I'm doing everything it is that I can or whether there's more that I do, whether there's more that I need to do. So, so I look forward to that. So with that, we're going to close things down for today. And uh, we'll be back with that first episode on shed hunting. Until then, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all very much. Well, hopefully you got some information here today that was of value to you, and we hope that you enjoyed the episode. In our next episode, obviously, we're going to be talking about shed hunting. We've got a special guest that we're going to bring on, uh, a longtime team member of White Knuckle Productions and a longtime friend of Todd and mine. With that, we're going to close out this episode. We thank everyone again for listening. Look for our upcoming show on any of our social media feeds. We will post it there when it's up and ready to go. With that, Jason out.